welcome and my name is Dr. Lori Ernstberger and we're going to be spending some time talking about bullying prevention in schools. I want to begin by telling you just a little bit about myself. I am an education consultant and I have the opportunity to travel all over the world talking to parents and professionals who work with children with disabilities. I began my teaching career back in Indiana actually in 1985. I was a classroom teacher uh, for students with behavior dis disorders and over the last 29 years I've been able to uh, travel. I've written some books on teaching children with autism, uh, girls on the autism spectrum, and I'll have a book out later this year on bullying prevention and children with disabilities. I want to provide my email address. I'm going to be sharing with you some strategies and interventions on bullying prevention, but in case you have any follow-up questions or comments, you can always reach me at drlaurie at cox.net, which you see there on your screen. I have my PhD in special education, and I'm also a board-certified behavior analyst, so I hope to uh, provide some strategies, not only based in terms of for children with disabilities, but some really effective and evidence-based interventions for the classroom. Now we're going to be looking at the three R's to bullying prevention, and those are recognize, respond, and report. So my plan is that we're going to review the prevalence rates and some of the statistics around bullying in schools, some of the stereotypes that we have for students who exhibit bullying behaviors and victims of bullying. Then I'm going to provide some very practical uh, interventions that can be used both school-wide and in the classroom. And then we're going to be looking at reporting systems and what can your school do in terms of more effective reporting and investigating uh, bullying and disability harassment. So the three R's to bullying prevention, recognize, respond, and report. Now for myself, as I mentioned, I started teaching in 1985 and I can honestly say my first few years of teaching, I don't remember ever talking about bullying in school. And I taught students that were right at the height of bullying that we know from the research now, but this was in 1985 before really anyone was talking about bullying in schools. Um, I don't remember discussing it with my students or teaching them how to react to bullying. I had students with behavior disorders and they were probably exhibiting bullying behaviors, but it was not a topic that was addressed for many years. Um, I did not dis discuss it in my presentations or in my writing. And it really wasn't until I met Melissa, who you see here with her brother. Melissa is her pseudonym that I'm using. And Melissa, I interviewed uh, for a book that I wrote on girls uh, with autism spectrum disorders. And Melissa, just a very talented young woman, uh, she had a lot of strengths, lots of stories to tell me about her brother and her family and her, uh, her grandparents, um, traveling that she has done. But one of our topics of conversations when I was interviewing Melissa was on her social relationships in school. And this is when Melissa started telling me just some horrific stories of how she was treated by some of the girls in her school. She talked about ongoing bullying that occurred year after year. She mentioned that she had told many teachers that she was being bullied. And there was just no response, no ending the bullying. She said they had a meeting. She remembers going to a meeting with the principal of the school. And even though they said they were going to work on it and stop, still the bullying repeated. And she told me, this is years later re when she was mentioning this, that she felt like she still was traumatized by those years of bullying. And so it was that interview that I really started to examine what should we be doing at bullying, about bullying um, for students with disabilities. And Melissa told me that even after all the years and, and after growing up and being an adult, she said she still not only is traumatized by the bullying itself, but she's traumatized by the silence of others. And when I asked her to expand on that silence of others, she said, you know, Dr. Lori, other students watched this happen and did nothing. She said that there were paraprofessionals in her school that knew that she was being bullied, 
and did nothing. Even the principal that I mentioned, really the action wasn't there to end the bullying. And so when I left that interview, I thought about Melissa and I was writing my notes and when I wrote down the silence of others, I thought, that's me. I'm the silence of others. I traveled the world talking to teachers. I've written some books. I had spoke to teachers in the classroom and yet I had never addressed the topic of bullying and what we can be doing in schools. That made me the silence of others. And so I had agreed and, and I told Melissa after that point that I would use my uh, ability to talk to you, uh, to talk to parents and teachers all across the world on how can we prevent bullying and what can we do for children that are, we know today are being bullied and harassed in school. So that's my goal as we look at the three R's to bullying prevention is really to not be the silence of others. And it starts with recognizing that bullying happens. You know, we know from the prevalence rates that about 32%, we're talking one in three, this is typical developing children according to the U.S. Department of Education. One in three children, one in three students in your school is being bullied. When we start then looking at children with disabilities, that number doubles to 60%. 60% according to Ability Path report that children with disabilities are bullied, disability harassment, and I'll clarify that in a minute. 88% according to a study in Massachusetts reported that students with ASD were being bullied in schools. So we can see that the numbers of bullying in schools doubles, triples when, it talk, when we are talking about individuals with disabilities. Um, we also know that about 160,000 students miss school every day due to bullying in schools. And so the bullying research, um, although it wasn't there when I started teaching in 1985, um, is there now. We know what the prevalence rates, we know the statistics on children with disabilities, that they are at risk for being bullied. And it really begins, I want to mention a, a pioneer in the field of bullying, and that is Dan Alveas. Uh, he was uh, from Norway, wrote a book um, called Bullying at School, dated 1993. And this was really a seminal piece of research on what we can do on bullying. Uh, there's a great uh, amount of work that's been done since 1993, and I'm going to talk about that. But I think it's important for all of us working in schools as well as parents to understand some of the pioneers or some of the early research that was done, and that's still applicable today. Some of you might be using the, Alve the Alveus Bullying Prevention Program, which is an evidence-based program um, um, that's utilized in schools. Now I mentioned Ability Path, and this is a document that you can download for free called Walk a Mile in Their Shoes. This is a document that could be used in schools, for parents, administrators, on how to prevent bullying, how to address bullying in an IEP, and it talks about why children with disabilities are at risk for being bullied in schools, why they have higher rates of peer rejection. So if you, if you want to look up a document that you can download um, that's specific to children with disabilities, it's called Walk a Mile in Their Shoes. And it might help the people, if you're a parent, it might help the school team to better understand your child's experience. Now, what is bullying? We certainly have a variety of definitions that have been adopted at the state level, at, that has been adopted at the district level. But this last year, in 2014, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, along with the Education Department, released a definition of bullying. And here are just some of the highlights of that definition. It's unwanted behavior um, by a youth, not siblings. Um, it may be a perceived power imbalance, we're going to talk about that, that is repeated over time. Um, and it inflicts harm. It inflicts distress or trauma onto the victim. You can look up that CDC definition um, that is also available online. I'll give you that website in a minute. 
So what is bullying? What, what can we take from that CDC definition? Um, repeated interactions, but it also can be a one-time event if that event is severe enough. And we can imagine that there may be such an aggressive act that takes place in school that may be considered bullying, even if it's a one-time occurrence. Um, it is a power imbalance, so it's power and control. You have a dominant, powerful student, and power does not just mean uh, power in strength. Power can mean socioeconomic power. It may mean academic power, a student who has more academic achievement than another student. So power imbalance is in different areas. There could be a gender power imbalance. So it's not just based on physicality of a student. You may have a very, what, what you might consider more of a weaker student who is cyberbullying a student that has more physical power. So power imbalance is not just on terms of the child's, uh, what they look like or appearance or that physicality. We know that bullying takes many forms from hitting, social exclusion, gestures, name calling. Um, and then also in the area of texting and cyberbullying, I'm not going to address that as specific type of bullying, but know that cyberbullying in most states um, is included in your state regulations. Now, some of the laws on bullying prevention, uh, depending on what state you're from, and you can go to stopbullying.gov, and I'll give that website to you again in a minute. That's the U.S. Department of Education's website. You can learn and read your state's laws and policies on bullying. But some states have included um, terminology that is bullying is an intentional act or bullying is a willful act. And I encourage school professionals to take a look at that terminology. Bullying is never based on the perspective of the perpetrator or the bully. Bullying is determined based on the harm done or the distress done to the victim. And so a child can easily say, uh, I didn't mean it, right? Oops, my bad. It wasn't my intention to hurt them. It wasn't my intention to repeatedly call them that name. That cannot be an excuse for uh, dismissing an act of bullying. And the Office of Civil Rights has made it clear for children with disabilities, it's not about the intention or the willfulness. It is if it is unwelcome towards the party that's being harmed or the victim of bullying. And so I, I caution the terminology because it might be easy as I invest, let's say I'm going to investigate an act of bullying that somebody reported, an incident of bullying. But now my, my bully, my dad, and we'll talk about terminology, is saying, oh, I didn't mean it. It was an accident. I didn't mean to push them or throw their book bag into the toilet. It was an accident. We were just kidding. Does that excuse the behavior when it's really harmed the child? So uh, when we investigate bullying, it's based on the unwelcome conduct and not on the intentional act. So that's something to consider as we recognize what is bullying. Now, bullying is not normal childhood conflict. We are not going to resolve all childhood conflict. And some conflict is good because we need to learn conflict resolution skills as part of our social emotional learning curriculum. We need to learn to resolve typical peer conflict that happens um, between two uh, children of the same power, same status, right? Uh, maybe they're friends, but they're having a disagreement. And so we can differentiate between bullying and normal disagreements that occur every day in schools. But we need to define that behavior so students understand the difference as well. So our language is very important. Now, as we are recognizing what bullying is, I want us to be careful about labels. It's very easy to label the bully and then the victim. Um, and those are not forever labels. We have to be very careful with our language. Sometimes the bully victim 
is a dynamic exchange where sometimes the bully is the victim and the victim is the bully. Um, you may know a child with a disability who has been victimized by bullies, but they may also turn around and in other situations, they are the perpetrator of bullying. So these are not forever labels and the dynamic between a bully and a victim is often, um, often changes over time and is not something that's permanent. Office of Civil Rights um, you know, talks about using those labels of bullying in terms of how do we describe bullying behavior and I wanna talk about the R word. If you have not pledged uh, to spread the word, to end the word, I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Pause me, go to the r-word.org and you're going to see, take the pledge to spread the word, to end the word. And what does that mean? You are pledging as whatever role you are in a school, um, if you're a parent, that you're not only not going to use the word retarded to insult someone, um, the R word has become such a pejorative, such a negative connotation that we've had to change that label to intellectual disability. But it's still used as a put down. It's still used as a way to insult someone. And that's something we need to stop in our schools. Um, we need to teach kids that words hurt, that words mean something. And so if you wanna just quickly take a time, pledge the word, um, in March of every year, uh, the R Word campaign will do a big pledge drive. This is something you can do in your school. Um, you can have your student council involved to spread the word, to end the word. Not only that you're not going to use the word, but you're going to educate others if they use it in your um, earshot. So as a teacher, if you hear that in the hallway, you're going to stop the action and say, that's not okay. We don't use that word in this school, right? That has another meaning. We're going to educate. So the label does matter. We have to look at our words and terminology. Now, when we're talking about the Office of Civil Rights, um, which we, when we talk about disability harassment, they have uh, several law, federal laws that protect children with disabilities in schools. There are three main laws that you need to be aware of. Number one is the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, that goes back to 1973. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, so the ADA in 1990, and also the IDEA. If you have a child with an IEP, they are protected under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Now some of us, some of you might be working with children that have a 504 plan. They also have disability protections under that first law, Section 504. Schools need to know that that child has greater protections than your students in that general education uh, 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 um, environment. And so the Office of Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Education have written three letters and these letters detail the responsibilities for schools on not only preventing bullying and disability harassment, but what they must do if um, a child with a disability is involved with bullying. And I encourage you to print off those letters, particularly the last two that's on my list. They're called Dear Colleague Letters, DCL, you might see that in abbreviation. Um, the last two, what were written in July of 2010 that come from the Office of Civil Rights. Parents, professionals, anyone can print that letter for free and learn what your responsibilities are um, as a school uh, personnel that receives federal funding. And then OSERS wrote a letter August 20th, 2013 that detailed exactly what is disability harassment and what schools should be doing in terms of evidence-based practice, and that's what that EBP stands for. Um, it's the 2013 with the enclosure of evidence-based practices. Students that have an IEP, as well as students with 504 plans, have greater protections than students in the general ed uh, population. So 
who are, and again, using that label of victims, who are those victims? Um, we know that the signs of uh, bullying may change for children with disabilities. They may be missing school. They may be having sleep disruptions, eating disruption. They may be having uh, uh, impact in terms of learning in school, um, skipping classes. Maybe they don't want to ride the bus. We need to be looking for the signs. We know that long-term bullying uh, changes children. We know that it causes depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, self-esteem. There's health risks involved um, with bullying in, in school, absence of school. And unfortunately to say, it does cause students to not cause directly um, suicide, but having thoughts of suicide. Um, and you might have even heard the term bully side as it relates to bullying. Um, there's often other factors contributing to that. Some of you might be familiar with a, with a very tragic uh, case in 2010, a very tragic young woman who committed suicide, Phoebe Prince. But she was one of the first young women uh, that, that made the media attention that schools really took a, took, uh, took a look at their policies. Again, um, the ideology around suicide might be there. That doesn't mean that children that are bullied commit suicide. We have to be very careful about our language and we don't want to make a direct causation. There are other factors that probably contribute to those scenarios. But we must take those long-term signs and uh, 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 of victims of bullying seriously in schools. Also recognizing that the bully, again, is not a forever, forever label. Students who bully, that changes over time. We tend to have stereotypes. If you could just close your eyes for a minute and picture, what does a bully look like? You know, we kind of have these the playground bully, you know, he's a tough kid, he's a mean kid, he doesn't do well in school, he, you know, he uses foul language or, he, you know, we kind of just have these movie stereotypes of the mean girl, if you ever saw that movie. But those are stereotypes. According to a leading psychologist, Susan Swearer, she says any student can become a bully given the right environment. So your jocks, your smart uh, students that are cheerleaders and student council, your students that are in your uh, more computer geeky areas. We cannot pigeonhole what a bully may or may not look like. It can be any child. There was a, an excellent study of 1,900 students, and they surveyed these students in this school, and they said, identify your coolest kids in the school. Who are the cool kids? And then that same survey said, identify who are the bullies in your school. And guess what? There was quite an overlap between the cool kids and the kids who exhibited bullying types of aggressive behaviors. So we've got to um, not have this very strict thinking in terms of this is the type of bully that we see. We can't predetermine what a bully may look like. So our first R was recognized. Recognize that 160,000 students miss school every day, one in 10 dropouts due to bullying. So it is affecting your school's academic achievement. It is affecting your school's graduation rates, as well as it is affecting a large amounts of students, statistically, of students with disabilities are bullied in schools. And so we, we looked at who the bullies and who the victims might be. But now what can we do? So I talked about taking the pledge. That's something that you could do in your school. That's a school-wide activity. So I want to make sure that all schools, we are um, responding, the second R, with a multi-tiered response. So we're going to implement district and school-wide universal interventions that all schools, all children, all students participate in. That's like the pledge drive. We're going to have a pledge drive where we all sign the pledge uh, to take the word, spread the word to end the word, or the R word. Now we're going to look at classroom level interventions. What can that specific teacher be doing in her or his classroom, whether it's K to 12? And then I'm also going to be looking at individual interventions at the higher level. Now, many of you are familiar with the tiered approach. The tiered approach, this multi-tiered approach has been used with positive behavior supports. It's been used back um, into the 90s. Uh, Hill Walker, 
uh, started using this um, framework for interventions in schools. So I'm sure you're used to seeing that visual framework. And now we're just using that same framework for bullying uh, prevention responses. So what can the school or district do district-wide? Well, first of all, have a policy. Is it written down? Where is that policy kept? It should be on the school's website. I should be able to go to um, Johns County School District and I should be able to read their specific policies and procedures. So it's available online to parents, students to read, to review, to print off. Um, there really needs to be more than just the policy, but what is actually going to take place in the school? What are the set activities that we're going to be doing daily, monthly, yearly to prevent bullying? Mm -hmm. Policies are fine. Don't bully in school. That's my policy. Uh, bullying uh, is not allowed. That's a policy. But what does it actually look like? So if I was a, t if I was a parent, what activities are you actually implementing? And what do those activities look like? So that written manual of procedures. You probably have in your school a safety procedures for other safety issues. Well, bullying is a school safety issue. And so we need to include bullying as part of school safety and have those standard operating procedures as well. Now, how do we create these activities or manuals or procedures manuals? Well, we use a school safety team. Just like with any school improvement plan, it's got to be a collaborative team approach as we do any areas in school. And so that school safety team, and that might be uh, labeled different names in your school, it might include an anti-bullying coordinator, but it must include all the stakeholders, um, for example, parents, community members, and students, students that are at high risk of being bullied in school. So students with disabilities should be involved in these teams. They may not go to every meeting, but where is their voice? Where are their recommendations? You know, we have to listen to the students who are directly um, being harmed by bullying and harassment, your LGBT students. So that school safety team should have a set agenda, they should be meeting regularly, and they should have measurable outcomes. What is that team doing? What specific activities are they um, going to implement throughout the school year? And that's what a school safety team, um, th that's their goal and that's their purpose. And we're going to include stakeholders and students as appropriate um, to get their feedback. Of course, professional development is a school-wide. So we're at our universal interventions. Everyone needs training from the bus driver to the cafeteria worker. I mean, our cafeteria staff, they see bullying. And if there's a child with a disability, they need to know that they are as responsible as that classroom teacher for stopping that bullying, reporting that bullying, following up to make sure that that disability harassment ends. And so there are many online courses and webinars. Um, there's, a, there's a bus transportation um, bullying website. Uh, I don't have it on that, that slide. You can always email me uh, as a follow-up. But if you put in uh, uh, federal webinars, uh, bus transportation and bullying, there's a whole webinar on how to uh, train bus drivers on protecting students on the, on the bus. Um, part of that professional training has to um, uh, let all staff know the legal re ramifications for disability harassment. So printing off those dear colleague letters and making sure that each of those evidence-based practices from the August 20th, 2013 is included in that training and that all staff know that there is consistent standard operating procedures for intervening when you observe a bullying incident. I often will ask a group of teachers, maybe a hundred teachers might be in a, in a staff development day, and I'll ask the team, how would you respond to a bullying incident? And if I have a hundred staff, I tend to have a hundred different responses. Everything from, well, I usually wait and I check later to make sure everything's okay, all the way to another extreme, I tell them they better stop it or I'll show them how to bully. You know, we have these, all these disparate, fragmented approaches. 
And what we need is standard operating procedures. How do you want the adults in your school to intervene when they observe what they think is an act of bullying? It doesn't have to take a 20 minute lecture, but what do you want the, those adults to do? So where are your standard operating procedures for adult responding? I, as we look at universal interaction or interventions, so I'm on my multi-tiered universal interventions, what about student surveys? Are you conducting anonymous student surveys throughout the school year? They're free. This is what I love to be able to tell teachers and, and administrators and school leaders. It doesn't cost anything. Um, there's, you can go to organizations, as you see the National School Climate Center, they have free surveys online. Uh, the CDC has free surveys that you can download. Um, in the last couple years, the Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention, um, they produced two documents that you can download and review online for free, parents, professionals, one measuring bullying, and, another, and then the second one is how to create your own survey. These are experts in the field. These are uh, expert panels who have come together to create uh, these two documents. So if you don't know where to start on doing a survey, this is where you want to start. Review your, your school safety team can review some of the uh, already developed uh, surveys available, or you can create your own, and they will walk you through how to do that. And so we're talking about universal interventions, and of course we're talking about creating that positive school climate. And what can we be doing? Awareness campaigns, bullying awareness campaigns that are embedded throughout the school year, where we are teaching not just on bullying, but diversity and disability awareness and cultural awareness. Does my school regularly have activities, not just around the holidays on, you know, okay, we're going to talk about one specific culture at a holiday. No, throughout the school year, we're embedding activities to promote awareness um, on bullying, on acceptance of people that are different than us. Here are a few other activities that your school safety team might want to include throughout the year. How about the principal take a pledge? And what you're seeing on your screen is a principal's pledge that comes from the Bully Project. If you have not seen the documentary on, on bullying, I encourage you to watch the documentary for yourself and then determine if that documentary might be something that you show to your entire school. Um, over, I think it might be up to a million. I don't want to give the exact number, but uh, this documentary has been shown to schools uh, throughout uh, the United States, actually internationally. And so part of their program is the principal taking a pledge that they are going to create safe schools for all children. Uh, many schools are doing uh, kindness weeks. Those are great. I'm not saying we're not going to do a kindness week. But we have to be careful that that's not all we do, right? One week, October has kind of been identified as Bullying Prevention Month. And some schools have said, well, we're going to do a kindness week. Well, it needs to be more than that. Um, so here's a school that posted. They did a pledge drive. They had all their students sign the pledge. The end of bullying begins with me. So that's a great photo to have. I want to see that on the front page of every school district's website so that you're promoting your message that we're creating a safe school. And again, a one-time assembly. And I know some schools are even paying for guest speakers to come in and do an assembly. That's great to empower at the beginning of the school year and maybe to, to start some an, an enthusiastic program. But then it's the weekly, monthly, and sometimes daily activities of follow-up that's so important to, these, um, to sustainability and fidelity of, of interventions over time. Another school-wide activity is identify your hotspots. And this is mentioned um, in many of the research articles out there that we have to increase supervision in hotspots. How do you know where the hotspots are? Ask your students. 
Uh, one of the things I recommend is just take a map of your school, which you can see there on the slide, uh, just a basic map of your school, hand it out to your students anonymously and say, mark where bullying occurs in the school and then add up where the most marks are, right? Do some tallies and say, oh, wait a minute, that hallway or is it outside of that bus stop? Where is it occurring on your campus? Um, and then we can follow up by increasing and assigning adult to that one particular spot. I've mentioned cyberbullying quickly, and that is something that needs a little bit uh, more in detail, and that's why I'm giving you a book that you might want to follow up with called Cyberbullying, Bullying in the Digital Age. This is a very comprehensive book uh, um, for school personnel on how to prevent and how to address cyberbullying in your school. Let's move on to our uh, tiered response in res uh, for classroom level interventions. And I want to give you a few ideas. What can, if I'm the classroom teacher, and maybe unfortunately I'm at a district that has not quite put policies in place, and maybe I'm at a school who doesn't have any standard operating procedures, you know, maybe we're not there yet. Maybe we're working on some action steps. But as a teacher, I still have responsibilities to protect and create a safe environment for my students. And one of the things that I can be doing is using those social emotional learning curriculum and embedding those into my classroom. Social emotional learning, teaching self-management, uh, interpersonal relationship skills, social skills awareness. Some states have adopted SEL curriculums states Illinois, Texas, if you're from those states. If not, you can go online and there's a website, uh, the CASEL, which is a national organization on social emotional learning, and they will actually give you some very specific activities that you as a classroom teacher could embed. I'm not talking about we're going to replace reading with SEL activities. What I'm saying is that we can create opportunities in my week, in my month, um, short opportunities to address social emotional learning which will better prepare all our students for addressing bullying or disability harassment. Another thing that you as the classroom teacher, um, as a paraprofessional, maybe related service, hopefully this is being done school-wide, but sometimes I know that some schools are still in the learning curve on bullying awareness. Uh, classroom teachers do a bystander education program. Teach bystanders what to do when they see bullying. Um, we know from the research that about 85% of all bullying incidents are witnessed by other students. 85%, so the majority of those incidents, other kids are seeing. How do I educate um, those peers uh, to stand up for other children? What can they do? As Michelle Borba, who is a psychologist, talks about, bystanders do play a critical role in ending bullying, but they need the steps of what to do. We need to teach them how to build bonds with others. I, I like this program, actively caring for people. That's what we should all be doing. And this is a great uh, website that we can embed this type of actively caring for all our friends in the classroom as well. Now, I want to make sure that when you're doing a bystander education program, it doesn't just mean we're telling bystanders you have to stand up to the bully. You'll see this uh, little picture that's there. Don't be a bystander, be an upstander. Well, that is good advice, but not all children have the personality or have the characteristics to stand up to this bully. Remember, the bully has a lot of power in that school. Not just physical power, but other types of power, status in that school. And if I'm a child who I'm more of a passive person, I'm a more introvert, I don't have the skills to speak up to that bully. Is there anything else that I can do to help the victim? And we have to let bystanders know, yeah, there are other things that you can do. And there's a wonderful uh, book by uh, Davis and Nixon, and it's called The Youth Voice Project. It's just come out recently. And it asked other students, it asked students, what would you like um, your peers to do if you're being bullied? What could they do to help you? And here are some suggestions, not just to stand up to the bully. And that is good advice, and we can practice that with programs like Stop 
Walk, Talk. That's a program that you can find online, free to download at um, Positive Behavior Supports. So standing up to the bully. But other things that you can do is spend time with the victim, tell an adult, give advice to victims of bullying, help them get away. So it's important that we review with our students based on their age, based on their, um, uh, on their own interpersonal skills, that you don't have to just stand up to the bully. You can help decrease victimization just by being a good friend, actively caring for people. So we want to review all of that in our bystander education programs. And we want to use literature as part of bystander education, books like The Juice Box Bully. Now, if you've never used literature, sometimes referred to as bibliotherapy, um, it just means a way to take a book that you're going to read, age-appropriate book for your students, and use their, the characters of the book and the, the um, activities in the book to discuss how we can be kind, how we can intervene. Uh, one of my favorite organizations is to teach, Teaching Tolerance, tolerance.org. And this organization provides lesson plans on how to use literature in the classroom for teaching on diversity, teaching on disability awareness, and all of those areas of cultural awareness as well. So use the literature for your bystander education programs. Now my third tier, we did, we did school-wide level, we did classroom level, individual level, where on the IEP or 504 plan, is it addressing bullying and harassment? We know that those present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, yes, we write about academic achievement, but functional performance means social, emotional uh, relationship skills. If the research and statistics are telling us that 60% of children with disabilities are being bullied in schools, then IEPs need to reflect that. IEPs need to be the place where we are writing goals and objectives to teach the skills of communication, how to carry yourself in terms of assertive body language, how to respond to a bully, those self-advocacy skills so that a child can say no. And so it's really important that we include in IEPs at least having the discussion. And for my parents watching, um, you have the right as your participation in that IEP team to say, I want to have um, the issue of bullying or if it's the level of disability harassment, I want it addressed in that IEP or 504 plan for the, that population as well. Uh, Michelle Borba, I want to give you her website. She's a psychologist that does talk about bullying uh, prevention in schools. She talks about teaching kids the calm approach. And I won't go through each one of those. You can look up her program. The calm approach just means teach the C-A-L-M. We got to teach kids to cool down. That's stress management. That's part of your social emotional learning. We need to also teach kids to cool down on the inside but look assertive on the outside. That's your nonverbal skills teaching kids to look them in the eye, C-A-L-M, and mean it. What do you want kids to say? What do you want your students to say? So if you're a child with a disability, how do you want them to respond to a bully? Um, we want to make sure they don't say the wrong thing. They may say something that's inappropriate, and they end up getting in trouble. And that's certainly been a stories that I've heard. I love the website bullystoppers.com, 101 great comeback lines that are safe to say in school that are PG rated. So our IEPs have to include a, uh, at least a discussion in our present levels area on functional performance. Are we concerned about st the students having deficit areas in that social emotional realm that might be um, a risk factor for disability harassment? We might also want to talk about supervision, increasing supervision, leaving class early, staff training. I'm not recommending any of those specifically, but at least it should be part of that multidisciplinary team's discussion. Here's a couple of things what not to do. What not to do, isolate the child who is the victim of bullying. And I've heard this story too many times where the school says, you're being bullied at lunch? Well, why don't you eat lunch in the office? Why don't you take your lunch in the library? 
you are now restricting that child's program. You are punishing the victim. And so we never want to change services. Um, and this is a quote from o, uh, the Office of Civil Rights. We're not going to tell the child with a disability, oh, I'm sure you can handle it. Well, that's, that's what not to do. We don't want to move the victim. So if you're a parent and you've reported to the school that your child is being bullied, um, you don't want to hear things like, well, we'll move their math class then. If math is the problem, um, there's a child in there, we'll move them to a different math class. That is not the response. Um, we also want to avoid conflict resolution conferences because that just re-traumatizes the child. Uh, many of our kids, on this, uh, uh, not only on the spectrum, children with uh, disabilities have difficulty communicating, especially if they've been traumatized. We don't want to sit them down in front of the person who's the perpetrator. So those are things what not to do. And also zero tolerance. Um, zero tolerance policies are not effective and should not be used at school. Zero tolerance has been used and started with gun control in school. Unfortunately, now we're using zero tolerance policies uh, for bullying prevention. Those are ineffective. There's no research to support. And what we know is zero tolerance just increases the disproportionality of children with disabilities are suspended from school. So if you want to learn more about the lack of evidence for using zero tolerance, uh, go to the Equity Project at Indiana University, and they have put out um, several uh, research papers on the topic of zero tolerance in schools. Okay, our last R, I want to go through recognize, respond, and the last on report. Um, here's the website where you can learn about your state's laws on reporting. Stop bullying.gov and you can review your uh, state's uh, policies and your state's laws for reporting. Know that most adults underestimate reporting bullying in school. They underestimate. So studies have shown that when you ask the adults in a school, do you think you have a problem with bullying in your school? Is it mild, moderate, severe? The adults will say, oh, I think it's mild. Then they will survey those same students um, in that school. What do you think about the bullying in your school? And the students say the problem is severe. So we have this gap between the adults thinking it's mild and the students saying it's severe. It goes back to the reason why we need to survey students. This is a free document. It's one of the best overviews of bullying and evidence-based practices that you can download for your library and it was uh, published by the American Educational Research Association in 2013, AERA.net. It's free. It might be about 125 pages, but if you download no other document from our seminar, this one will give you a complete overview from the top experts in the field of bullying prevention in schools. I've mentioned surveys. Uh, we should be doing surveys both um, at the beginning of the school year and throughout the school year to ask students anonymously about bullying in schools. It, again, it's free and it takes very little time out of the teacher's school day to give a quick uh, five to ten minute survey and then your school safety team will review the data to determine how are we doing. Because remember, we manage what we measure. And if I'm not measuring bullying, now we can't measure just based on a written report because those will be underestimated because students don't report bullying. We, we know that students as they get older at high school, only 28% of students said that they actually report bullying to an adult. So we have to do the survey so that we get a complete picture of data on how do we measure bullying in our schools. So we have to look at the data not based on the national statistics, right? If I just look at the national statistics that say 32% of, of students are bullied in school, well, that doesn't really apply to me, me, Lori Ernstberger, classroom teacher at John's Elementary School. Um, I've got to look at my data, and that's the, the quote that you see here. I've got to look at the data based on my school, on my classroom. What does data look like for fourth grade in my school? And I can aggregate that data for fourth grade, and that gives that teacher the information they need to make data-based decision-making. 
Um, but so if we're not using surveys, we're going to have a gap in the accountability of data. Reporting procedures, I'm giving you some information based on the Office of Civil Rights, um, what we need to be doing to investigate. Um, if a parent, if a student, if a teacher has reported bullying, what are my requirements to investigate, to stop the bullying, and to make sure that retaliation does not occur in the future. And I encourage you, again, to look at uh, the Dear Colleague letters from the Office of Civil Rights on what the school's responsibility, not to just investigate, but to ensure that all incidents of future bullying has uh, been ended and has stopped. I love this school district's website, and so I'm going to I'm going to promote them. Uh, this is a smaller school district in Texas, and so good for you, Hondo ISD. And if you can just make out real quick, if you'll take a look at the red, the little red sign, that is your, uh, that is that dis school district's way to report bullying. Does your district have this on their website where I, as a parent at home, my child comes home from school, they tell me about something that's happened, I want to report it right away, I can go on my school's website and I can quickly fill in a form and send it to that school district leader or the anti-bullying coordinator or maybe it goes to the principal of that school depending on how the program is set up. This is free, right? Any, most school districts already have a website. Adding this as a component. The other thing I would want to add to that is what can that parent be telling that child in the evening? So I have my child who came home, told me something about bullying at school. What advice should you give that parent? And there's so many great websites from stopbullying.gov and um, uh, bullying prevention websites that give parents some tips. Um, for example, the National Bullying Prevention Center from Pacer Center, pacercenter.org is a way to give parents some specific feedback because that parent's going to be worried about sending their child to school the next day. We want parents to be able to go to our school district's website and learn what they can do right that evening. Uh, this is another way for students to report bullying, hero in the hallway. Do you have an anonymous bullying box in your school? where kids can report. That's another free way to get reporting of bullying in schools. An overview here of the Office of Civil Rights requirements of preventing retaliation against bullying in the future. And you can go to the Office of Civil Rights to look up their requirements. I'm going to end here with um, what we can do as an annual yearly report. What do we do with our data? What do we do with the surveys? And we should be putting together a portfolio that we have for our stakeholders and parents to let them know that we take bullying seriously. So not only do we have a portfolio of pictures, of surveys, of open-ended questions, maybe parent meeting focus groups that show that we take this topic seriously. Maybe it's the principal signing the pledge. I put together some qualitative portfolio assessment. But then I also put together my quantitative data on reporting, my Likert scales on surveys. And each year that school safety team should have accountability at the end of that year. What did we do to prevent bullying? And what are our action steps for next year to decrease bullying and disability harassment in schools? My last free resource for, for you today is from Not In Our Schools. They have free video, lesson plans, and action guides um, that you can download as a classroom teacher, school leader, parent, um, to get the activities that you may need um, to create a multi-tiered approach to prevent bullying and disability harassment in school. I want to thank you very much. Again, our goal is to end the silence of others, going back to Melissa that we talked about. And any follow-up questions can be sent to me at drlaurie at cox.net. Thank you very much.